The Never-Ending Story Chapter 2 Atreyu's Mission Because of their special importance, deliberations concerning the welfare of all Fantastica were held in the great throne room of the palace, which was situated only a few floors below the Magnolia Pavilion. The large circular room was filled with muffled voices. The 499 best doctors in Fantastica had assembled there and were whispering or mumbling with one another in groups of varying sizes. Each one had examined the childlike empress, some more recently than others, and each had tried to help her with his skill. But none had succeeded. None knew the nature or cause of her illness, and none could think of a cure for it. Just then, the 500th Doctor, the most famous in all Fantastica, whose knowledge was said to embrace every existing medicinal herb, every magic filtry, and secret of nature, was examining the patient. He had been with her for several hours, and all his assembled colleagues were eagerly awaiting the result of his examination. Of course, this assembly was nothing like a human medical congress. To be sure, a good many of the inhabitants of Fantastica were more or less human in appearance, but at least as many resembled animals or were even farther from the human. The doctors inside the hall were just as varied as the crowd of messengers milling about outside. There were dwarf doctors with white beards and humps. There were fairy doctoresses in shimmering silvery blue robes and with glittering stars in their hair. There were white sprites with big round bellies and webbed hands and feet. Sitz baths had been installed for them. There were white snakes who had coiled up on the long table at the center of the room. There were witches, vampires, and ghosts, none of whom were generally reputed to be especially benevolent or conducive to good health. If you are to understand why these last were present, there is one thing you have to know. The childlike empress, as her title indicates, was looked upon as the ruler over all the innumerable provinces of the Fantastican Empire. But in reality, she was far more than a ruler. She was something entirely different. She didn't rule. She had never used force or made use of her power. She had never issued commands, and she never judged anyone. She never interfered with anyone and never had to defend herself against any assailant, for no one would have thought of rebelling against her or of harming her in any way. In her eyes, all her subjects were equal. She was simply there in a special way. She was the center of all life in Fantastica. And every creature, whether good or bad, beautiful or ugly, merry or solemn, foolish or wise, all owed their existence to her existence. Without her, nothing could have lived, any more than a human body can live if it has lost its heart. All knew this to be so, though no one fully understood her secret. Thus, she was respected by all the creatures of the Empire, and her health was of equal concern to them all, for her death would have meant the end of them all, the end of the boundless Fantastican realm. Bastion's thoughts wandered. Suddenly he remembered the long corridor in the hospital where his mother had been operated on. He and his father had sat waiting for hours outside the operating room. Doctors and nurses hurried this way and that. When his father asked about his wife, the answer was always evasive. No one really seemed to know how she was doing. Finally, a bald-headed man in a white smock had come out of them. He looked tired and sad. Much as he regretted it, he said, his efforts had been in vain. He had pressed their hands and mumbled something about heartfelt sympathy. After that, everything had changed between Bastion and his father. Not outwardly. Bastion had everything he could have wished for. He had a three-speed bicycle, an electric train, plenty of vitamin pills, 53 books, a golden hamster, an aquarium with tropical fish in it, a small camera, six pocket knives, and so forth and so on. But none of all this really meant anything to him. Bastion remembered that his father had often played with him in the past. He had even told him stories. No longer. He couldn't talk to his father anymore. 
There was an invisible wall around his father, and no one could get through to him. He never found fault, and he never praised. Even when Bastion was put back in school, his father hadn't said anything. He had only looked at him in his sad, absent way, and Bastion felt that as far as his father was concerned, he wasn't there at all. That was how his father usually made him feel. When they sat in front of the television screen in the evening, Bastion saw that his father wasn't even looking at it, that his thoughts were far away. Or when they both sat there with books, Bastion saw that his father wasn't reading at all. He'd been looking at the same page for hours and had forgotten to turn it. Bastion knew his father was sad. He himself had cried for many nights. Sometimes he had been so shaken by sobs that he had to vomit. But little by little it had passed. And after all, he was still there. Why didn't his father ever speak to him? Not about his mother, not about important things, but just for the feel of talking together. If we only knew, said a tall, thin fire sprite with a beard of red flames, if we only knew what her illness was. There's no fever, no swelling, no rash, no inflammation. She just seems to be fading away. No one knows why. As he spoke, little clouds of smoke came out of his mouth and formed figures. This time they were question marks. A bedraggled old raven, who looked like a potato with feathers stuck onto it every which way, answered in a croaking voice. He was a head cold and sore throat specialist. She hasn't got a cough. Medically speaking, it's no disease at all. He adjusted the big spectacles on his beak and cast a challenging look around. One thing seems obvious, buzzed the scarab, a beetle sometimes known as a pill roller. There is some mysterious connection between her illness and the terrible happenings these messengers from all Fantastica have been reporting. Oh yes, scoffed an ink goblin. You see mysterious connections everywhere. My dear colleagues, pleaded a hollow-cheeked ghost in a long white gown, Let's not get personal. Such remarks are quite irrelevant, and please, lower your voices. Conversations of this kind were going on in every part of the throne room. It may seem strange that creatures of so many different kinds were able to communicate with one another, but nearly all the inhabitants of Fantastica, even the animals, knew at least two languages. Their own, which they spoke only with members of their own species, and which no outsider understood, and the universal language known as High Fantastican. All Fantasticans used it, though some in a rather peculiar way. Suddenly, all fell silent, for the great double door had opened. In stepped Chiron, the far-famed master of the healer's art. He was what in older times had been called a centaur. He had the body of a man from the waist up, and that of a horse from the waist down. And Chiron was furthermore a black centaur. He hailed from a remote region far to the south, and his human half was the color of ebony. Only his curly hair and beard were white, while the horse-like half of him was striped like a zebra. He was wearing a strange hat plated of reeds. A large golden amulet hung from a chain around his neck. And on this amulet, one could make out two snakes, one light and one dark which were biting each other's tail, and so forming an oval. Everyone in Fantastica knew what the medallion meant. It was the badge of one acting on orders from the childlike empress, acting in her name as though she herself were present. It was said to give the bearer mysterious powers, though no one knew exactly what these powers were. Everyone knew its name, Orin. But many who feared to pronounce the name called it the Gem, or the glory. In other words, the book bore the mark of the childlike empress. A whispering passed through the throne room, and some of the doctors were heard to cry out. The gem had not been entrusted to anyone for a long, long time. Chiron stamped his hooves two or three times. When the disorder subsided, he said in a deep voice, Friends, don't be too upset. I shall only be wearing Orin for a short time. I am merely a go-between. 
Soon I shall pass the gem on to one worthier. A breathless silence filled the room. I won't try to misrepresent our defeat with high-sounding words. The childlike Empress's illness has baffled us all. The one thing we know is that the destruction of Fantastica began at the same time as this illness. We can't even be sure that medical science can save her. But it is possible, and I hope none of you will be offended at what I'm going to say. It is possible that we, we who are gathered here, do not possess all knowledge, all wisdom. Indeed, it is my last and only hope that somewhere in this unbounded realm, there is a being wiser than we are, who can give us help and advice. Of course, there is no more than a possibility. But one thing is certain. The search for this savior calls for a pathfinder. Someone who is capable of finding paths in the pathless wilderness, and who will shrink from no danger or hardship. In other words, a hero. And the childlike empress has given me the name of this hero, to whom she entrusts her salvation and ours. His name? is Atreyu, and he lives in the grassy ocean beyond the Silver Mountains. I shall transmit Orin to him and send him on the Great Quest. Now you know all there is to know. With that, the old centaur thumped out of the room. Those who remained behind exchanged looks of bewilderment. What was this hero's name? One of them asked. Atreyu or something of the kind, said another. Never heard of him, said the third, and all 499 doctors shook their heads in dismay. The clock in the belfry struck ten. Bastion was amazed at how quickly the time had passed. In class, every hour seemed to drag on for an eternity. Down below, they would be having history with Mr. Drone, a gangly, ordinarily ill-tempered man who delighted in holding Bastion up to ridicule because he couldn't remember the dates when certain battles had been fought, or when someone or other had reigned. The grassy ocean behind the Silver Mountains was many days' journey from the Ivory Tower. It was actually a prairie, as long and wide and flat as an ocean. Its whole expanse was covered with tall, juicy grass, and when the wind blew, Great waves passed over it with a sound like troubled water. The people who lived there were known as grass people, or greenskins. They had blue-black hair, which the men as well as the women wore long and often in pigtails, and their skin was olive green. They led a hard, frugal life, and their children, girls as well as boys, were brought up to be brave, proud, and generous. They learned to bear heat, cold, and great hardship, and were tested for courage at an early age. This was necessary because the Greenskins were a nation of hunters. They obtained everything they needed either from the hard, fibrous prairie grass or from the purple buffalo, great herds of which roamed the grassy ocean. These purple buffalo were about twice the size of common bulls or cows. They had long purplish-red hair with a silky sheen and enormous horns with tips as hard and sharp as daggers. They were peaceful as a rule, but when they scented danger or thought they were being attacked, they could be as terrible as a natural cataclysm. Only a greenskin would have dared to hunt these beasts, and moreover they used no other weapons than bows and arrows. The greenskins were believers in chivalrous combat, and often it was not the hunted but the hunter who lost his life. The Greenskins loved and honored the Purple Buffalo, and held that only those willing to be killed by them had the right to kill them. News of the childlike Empress's illness and the danger threatening all Fantastica had not yet reached the grassy ocean. It was a long, long time since any traveler had visited the tent colonies of the Greenskins. The grass was juicier than ever, the days were bright, and the nights full of stars. All seemed to be well. But one day, a white-haired black centaur appeared. His hide was dripping with sweat. He seemed totally exhausted, and his bearded face was haggard. 
On his head he wore a strange hat plated of reeds, and around his neck a chain with a large golden amulet hanging from it. It was Chiron. He stood up in the open space at the center of the successive rings of tents. It was there that the elders held their councils, and that the people danced and sang old songs on feast days. He waited for the greenskins to assemble, but it was only very old men and women and small children, wide-eyed with curiosity, who crowded around him. He stamped his hooves impatiently. Where are the hunters and huntresses? he panted, removing his hat and wiping his forehead. A white-haired woman with a baby in her arms replied, They are still hunting. They won't be back for three or four days. Is it... Is the trail with them? The centaur asked. Yes, stranger, but how can it be that you know him? I don't know him. Go and get him. Stranger, said an old man on crutches. He will come unwillingly, because this is his hunt. It starts at sunset. Do you know what that means? Chiron shook his mane and stamped his hooves. I don't know, and it doesn't matter. He has something more important to do now. You know this sign I am wearing. Go and get him. We see the gem, said a little girl. And we know you have come from the childlike empress, but who are you? My name is Chiron, the centaur growled. Chiron the physician, if that means anything to you. A bent old woman pushed forward and cried out, Yes, it's true. I recognize him. I saw him once when I was young. He is the greatest and most famous doctor in all Fantastica. The centaur nodded. Thank you, my good woman, he said. And now perhaps one of you will at last be kind enough to bring this Atreyu here. It's urgent. The life of the childlike empress is at stake. I'll go, cried a little girl of five or six. She ran away, and a few seconds later she could be seen between the tents galloping away on a saddleless horse. At last... Chiron grumbled. Then he fell into a dead faint. When he revived, he didn't know where he was, for all was dark around him. It came to him only little by little that he was in a large tent, lying on a bed of soft furs. It seemed to be night, for through a cleft in the door curtain he saw a flickering firelight. Holy horseshoes, he muttered, and tried to sit up. How long have I been lying here? A head looked in through the door opening and pulled back again. Someone said, Yes, he seems to be awake. Then the curtain was drawn aside and a boy of about ten stepped in. His long trousers and shoes were of soft buffalo leather. His body was bare from the waist up, but a long purple-red cloak, evidently woven from buffalo hair, hung from his shoulders. His long blue-black hair was gathered together and held back by leather thongs. A few simple white designs were painted on the olive-green skin of his cheeks and forehead. His dark eyes flashed angrily at the intruder. Otherwise, his features betrayed no emotion of any kind. "'What do you want of me, stranger?' he asked. "'Why have you come to my tent? And why have you robbed me of my hunt? If I had killed the big buffalo today, and my arrow was already fitted to my bowstring, I'd have been a hunter tomorrow. Now I'll have to wait a whole year. Why?' The old centaur stared at him in consternation. "'Am I to take it?' he asked. "'That you are a treyu?' That's right, stranger. Isn't there someone else of the same name? A grown man? An experienced hunter? No. I and no one else am Atreyu. Sinking back on his bed of furs, old Chiron gasped. (gasps) A child? A little boy? Really, the decisions of the childlike empress are hard to fathom. Atreyu waited in impassive silence. Forgive me, Atreyu, said Chiron, controlling his agitation with the greatest difficulty. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but the surprise has just been too great. Frankly, I'm horrified. I don't know what to think. I can't help wondering, did the childlike empress really know what she was doing when she was a youngster like you? It's sheer madness. If she did it intentionally, then... then... With a violent shake of his head, he blurted out, No! No! If I had known whom she was sending me to, I'd have refused to entrust you with the mission. I'd have refused. 
What mission? Atreyu asked. It's monstrous, cried Chiron indignantly. It's doubtful whether even the greatest, most experienced of heroes could carry out this mission. And you! She's sending you into the unfathomable to look for the unknown. No one can help you. No one can advise you. No one can foresee what will befall you. And yet you must decide at once, immediately, whether or not you accept the mission. There's not a moment to be lost. For ten days and nights I have galloped almost without rest to reach you, but now I almost wish I hadn't got here. Ah, I am very old. I am at the end of my strength. Give me a drink of water, please. Atreyu brought a pitcher of fresh spring water. The centaur drank deeply. Then he wiped his beard and said somewhat more calmly, oh, Thank you. Thank you. That was good. I feel better already. Listen to me, Atreyu. You don't have to accept this mission. The childlike empress leaves it entirely up to you. She never gives orders. I'll tell her how it is and she'll find someone else. She can't have known you were a little boy. She must have got you mixed up with someone else. That's the only possible explanation. What is this mission? Atreyu asked. To find a cure for the childlike empress, the centaur answered, and save Fantastica. Is she sick? Atreyu asked in amazement. Chiron told him how it was with the childlike empress and what the messengers had reported from all parts of Fantastica. Atreyu asked many questions, and the centaur answered them to the best of his ability. They talked far into the night, and the more Atreyu learned of the menace facing Fantastica, the more his face, which at first had been so impassive, expressed unveiled horror. To think, he murmured finally with pale lips, that I knew nothing about it. Chiron cast a grave, anxious look at the boy from under his bushy white eyebrows. Now you know the lie of the land, he said. And now perhaps you understand why I was so upset when I first laid eyes on you. Still, it was you the childlike empress named. Go and find Atreyu, she said to me. I put all my trust in him, she said. Ask him if he's willing to attempt the great quest for me and for Fantastica. I don't know why she chose you. Maybe only a little boy like you can do whatever has to be done. I, I don't know. And I can't advise you. Atreyu sat there with bowed head and made no reply. He realized that this was a far greater task than his hunt. It was doubtful whether the greatest hunter and pathfinder could succeed. How then could he hope? Well, the centaur asked, will you? Atreyu raised his head and looked at him. I will, he said firmly. Chiron nodded gravely. Then he took the chain with the golden amulet from his neck and put it around Atreus. Orin gives you great power, he said solemnly, but you must not make use of it, for the childlike empress herself never makes use of her power. Orin will protect you and guide you, but whatever comes your way you must never interfere, because from this moment on your own opinion ceases to count. For that same reason you must go unarmed. You must let what happens happen. Everything must be equal in your eyes, good and evil, beautiful and ugly, foolish and wise, just as it is in the eyes of the childlike empress. You may only search and inquire, never judge. Always remember that, Atreyu. Orin, Atreyu repeated with awe. I will be worthy of the glory. When should I start? Immediately, cried Chiron. No one knows how long your great quest will be. Every hour may count, even now. Say goodbye to your parents and your brothers and sisters. I have none, said Atreyu. My parents were both killed by a buffalo soon after I was born. Who brought you up? All the men and women together. That's why they called me Atreyu, which in our language means son of all. No one knew better than Bastion what that meant. Even though his father was still alive, and Atreyu had neither father nor mother. To make up for it, Atreyu had been brought up by all the men and women together, and was the son of all, while Bastion had no one. 
and was really nobody's son. All the same, Bastion was glad to have this much in common with Atreyu, because otherwise he resembled him hardly at all, neither physically nor in courage and determination. Yet Bastion too was engaged in a great quest and didn't know where it would lead him or how it would end. In that case, said the old centaur, you'd better go without saying goodbye. I'll stay here and explain. Atreyu's face became leaner and harder than ever. Where should I begin? he asked. Everywhere and nowhere, said Chiron. From now on, you will be on your own, with no one to advise you, and that's how it will be until the end of the great quest, however it may end. Atreyu nodded. Farewell, Chiron. Farewell, Atreyu, and much luck. The boy turned away and was leaving the tent when the centaur called him back. As they stood face to face, the old centaur put both hands on Atreyu's shoulders, looked him in the eye with a respectful smile, and said slowly, I think I'm beginning to see why the childlike empress chose you, Atreyu. The boy lowered his head just a while, then he went out quickly. His horse, Artax, was standing outside the tent. He was small and spotted like a wild horse. His legs were short and stocky, but he was the fastest, most tireless runner far and wide. He was still saddled as Atreyu had ridden him back from the hunt. Artax, Atreyu whispered, patting his neck. We're going away, far, far away. No one knows if we shall ever come back. The horse nodded his head and gave a brief snort. Yes, master, he said, but what about your hunt? We're going on a much greater hunt, said Atreyu swinging himself into the saddle. Wait, master, said the horse. You've forgotten your weapons. Are you going without your bow and arrow? Yes, Artax, said Atreyu. I have to go unarmed because I am bearing the gem. <laughs> snorted the horse. And where are we going? Wherever you like, Artax, said Atreyu. From this moment on, we shall be on the great quest. With that, they galloped away and were swallowed up by the darkness. At the same time, in a different part of Fantastica, something happened which went completely unnoticed. Neither Atreyu nor Artax had the slightest inkling of it. On a remote, night-black heath, the darkness condensed into a great shadowy form. It became so dense that even in that moonless, starless night, it came to look like a big black body. Its outlines were still unclear, but it stood on four legs, and green fire glowed in the eyes of its huge shaggy head. It lifted up its great snout and stood for a long while sniffing the air. Then suddenly it seemed to find the scent it was looking for, and a deep, triumphant growl issued from its throat, and off it ran through the starless night in long, soundless leaps. The clock in the belfry struck eleven. From the downstairs corridors arose the shouts of children running out to the playground. Bastion was still squatting cross-legged on the mats. His legs had fallen asleep. He wasn't an Indian after all. He stood up, took his sandwich and an apple out of his satchel, and paced the floor. He had pins and needles in his feet, which took some time to wake up. Then he climbed onto the horse and straddled it. He imagined he was a Treyu galloping through the night on Artax's back. He leaned forward and rested his head on his horse's neck. Gee, he cried, run, Artex! Then he became frightened. It had been foolish of him to shout so loud. What if someone had heard him? He waited a while and listened, but all he heard was the intermingled shouts from the yard. Feeling rather foolish, he climbed down off the horse. Really, he was behaving like a small child. He unwrapped his sandwich and shined the apple on his trousers, but just as he was biting into it, he stopped himself. No, he said to himself aloud. I must carefully apportion my provisions. Who knows how long they will have to last me. With a heavy heart, he rewrapped his sandwich and returned to his satchel along with the apple. Then, with a sigh, he settled down on the mats and reached for the book. <laughs>